So let's just spotlight the video for now. So tomorrow, it is St. David's Day, which means it's the first of, well, first of March, as, as we all know, uh, the first day of, uh, of that month of March. And we are continuing our rhythm as a church of prayer and fasting. Now, this Monday, we are, we're not going to have, I'm not going to hold a Zoom meeting. What I want us to think about for those of us who are taking part in this monthly rhythm of prayer and fast, I want to think about communication. Do we imagine um, that you're sitting with a family member, a friend, or a loved one? For instance, you know, I might be sitting with Donna. Imagine if every time we met, I had a list of things that I wanted to tell her and some answers that I needed from her and an agenda for our meeting. That does happen sometimes. We sit down with our diaries and we go through diaries and I tell her what meetings I've got, and especially as now the children are homeschooling and we've got you know, a limited number of computers. We've Thankfully, we've got more than one, but sometimes we have to work out who uses the computer when, but we've got more now. It makes, it makes life a lot easier. But we still have to sometimes bring our calendars and agenda and work out what is going on. And there's a purpose to our meeting and we want to achieve something from our conversation. But imagine if every conversation was like that. Imagine that. That, that would be no way to conduct a relationship. Sometimes we just sit down, there's no agenda, there are no diaries, we don't want to achieve anything. We don't finish our time together by saying, right, what did we achieve? This Monday, I'd like us to think about that in our time where we might be praying uh, and fasting with God. Don't, don't bring an agenda. Don't look for, 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 for answers. You may, you may receive them, but how about you treat that, the, this relationship with the Father as that kind of relationship where the only purpose is to be with him. That, that's what I want to do tomorrow. I've got quite a busy day tomorrow, and so I'm thinking, do you know what? If I carve out time, it's not going to be a time filled with an agenda just time spent with God. And you can do that in whatever way you feel comfortable. But I want to encourage you, as we're continuing with praying and fasting on the first day of every month, think particularly about not thinking, about coming to your heavenly Father with no agenda, no demands, no purpose other than to be. It might be more difficult for some, than for others. We know there are, all of us have different characters. But tomorrow, uh, it's something we should do every day, but particularly tomorrow on our monthly day of prayer and fasting, let's just be with God and see what happens. You may find answers just by being there, but just be. So that's just a notice and a reminder of what we're doing tomorrow as a church for those of us who are taking part in that. This morning, we're continuing to think about hope. Next week is the end of our hope series, not the end of our hope, but the end of our series on hope. And Rob will be bringing the message from uh, for, for that. So just to give you a notice of that. But for this morning, I want to read from the book of Hebrews. This is a book filled with hope. Well, the whole Bible is filled with hope. But Hebrews seems to mention it quite a bit. So I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. So Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. When God made a promise to Abraham, because he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently endured, obtained the promise. Human beings, of course, swear by someone greater than themselves, and an oath given as confirmation puts an end to all dispute. In the same way, when God desired to show even more clearly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it by an oath, so that through two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible that God would prove false. 
we who have taken refuge might be strongly encouraged to seize the hope set before us. We have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. hope. I'm uh, reading a book again. I mentioned it I think last Sunday and uh, often I'll read books um, twice or more often than that if, if I find them particularly good and I'm reading uh, uh, this book at the moment. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in mine it's reversed but you may be able to see it clearly. It's called Why We Sleep and uh, yeah it's interesting. And it talks about how the brain works during sleep, what happens during sleep. And now that science has moved on so much, uh, they can take very detailed images of the brain and find out exactly what's happening in which regions during sleep. And so they're able to identify the different uh, phases of sleep from uh, non-REM sleep to REM sleep. They're very inventive, you know, these sleep scientists. They thought, well, we'll call something REM sleep, rapid eye movement. And the stuff that doesn't involve rapid eye movement, we'll call it non-rapid eye movement sleep. There you go. Anyhow, this week, I want us to do something similar with hope. Now, we're not going to take a hopeful person or a person called hope and attach electrodes to their head and try and figure out what's going on. But what we will be doing is we're going to look at hope and ask, what is happening? What is going on? What should be happening? What should be going on in the lives of God's people of hope? And why? What does the hope that these biblical writers, particularly this one here who wrote the book of Hebrews, what does that kind of hope look like? So although I say we're not going to take somebody and put electrodes on their brains, imagine if we were to take someone and attach electrodes to their brain to figure out what hope looks like, what signals hope gives off, Abraham would be a great candidate to bring into the hope laboratory. He received many promises from God and he held on to them through difficulty. He held on to the hope that these promises would come to pass. Admittedly, he made some big mistakes, but God told him, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. And God did bless him and Abraham was a blessing. God told him this, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So just as before you sleep, your brain is releasing melatonin. And sleep pressure starts to build up. Who knows? You might be feeling that right now. You know, <laughs> in our study of hope, we also find a precursor, something that goes before deep hope. And according to the life of Abraham, that's obedience. Somehow, in most of these studies of hope, we find obedience leads into hope and sometimes the other way around hope leads into obedience but you will find obedience when you look at the life of a person who hopes and so if you wonder why your own life may not be filled with deep and refreshing hope first look to be obedient when God says follow you follow when God says, wait, you wait. Which leads us into the, the second element of hope that I think we would detect if we wired electrodes to somebody's brain who was hopeful. 
That is patience. I do not think that you can separate or have hope without patience. At least when I look at the characters in the Bible and the people I know, hope always is accompanied with patience. Six plus years ago, Donna and I were living in Kerry, just down the road, not far away, a nice cycle ride away. And uh, we knew that our time was coming to an end there. We were, we were coming to the end of our three year training and we were looking for a full time church. And I think I've said this to one or two of you, I may have said this to most of you, but I remember a day when we were on holiday, we were going, sorry, we were, it was our day off. And so what do we do on our day off? Well, we go to the big metropolis. We went to Welshpool, Kerry to Welshpool. You know, the big smoke, the big city where it's all going on. And uh, I remember, I think there was there were two of, our, two of the children in this uh, double push chair pram type thing. And uh, we actually stood outside Welshpool Baptist Church. And, and we were just talking and I got this strong sense and I was saying to Donna, I said, you know, if God calls us to Welshpool, do you know, we, we would come, wouldn't we? And Donna, Donna, I find my memory serves me right, said yes, we would. And we think we could make our home in this place. It just, just feels that kind of a place. We could worship here, we could follow Jesus here. But despite that moment and that, that sense of call, it didn't happen. Despite the sense there was work left unfinished for us, work we hadn't even started yet, God called us elsewhere because he knows best. And so we listened and we obeyed and God called us to the Forest of Dean, where for five years we followed Jesus and we worked alongside God's people. You know, just as an aside, did you know that faith in Jesus means you are a person of hope, whether you realise it or not? Well, at least according to the writer of this letter, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. So faith is the assurance of hope. So our faith in Jesus means that we must be people of hope. So almost five years into our time in the Forest of Dean, we felt certain again that God was calling us elsewhere. Uh, we felt certain it was Wales, though we visited ch churches in England. In fact, I don't think we visited a church in Wales until we came to Welshpool, but we felt called to Wales. Uh, in fact, we felt called to Mid Wales to be particular, even though at times that didn't seem likely. And I remember one holiday in a North Wales cottage and we made our minds up. Through what, though all the opportunities seem to be in England, we will stay true to the call back to Mid Wales. And if nothing materialises, we will stay where God has placed us. So I speak to you this morning, not as someone who's studied hope in scripture, but as someone who has seen with my own eyes what happens when stumbling obedience and the sometimes imperfect patience of humankind grasps the hope, grasps the promise that God gives. And mountains are moved by faith, which is the assurance of hope. And ministers and their families are moved and circumstances are changed and houses are bought and hope finds fulfilment. So hope, it requires obedience and it needs patience. Five years, six years, ten years might feel a long time. To God, that might not be. Hope requires patience but hope isn't passive it's not it's not some passive emotion a, a simple waiting oh I'm good at waiting in queues I'm a hopeful person well I'm lousy at waiting in queues I tell you but I'm a hopeful person so <laughs> thankfully hope isn't tied up simply with waiting it does require patience and maybe that's something I need to work on in queues 
But hope is active and requires action. It requires we who have taken refuge to seize and to hold, to grasp. Some translations talk about taking hold of, some talk about holding fast to. To me, that's, that's active. That's not just watching something drift in. Take hold of the hope set before us. One of the challenges of this pandemic is that most of us have been told quite rightly that our role is to do nothing. <laughs> you know, the way we can help is to stay at home, to not go out, to not meet up, to not do the normal things that we do, to not help people out. And then we see how hard some people are having to work in education and in health and in factories and in other organizations. And yet many of us are told rightly, <laughs> Stay at home. I was speaking with some folk uh, who were involved in one of the vaccine trials before Christmas, and they were telling me the reason they signed up. They said the reason they signed up was they wanted to do something. They, they didn't work in hospitals. They weren't nurses and doctors. They did not work in essential services. They were not scientists discovering new cures. But what they could do and what they did do was to present their arms and I guess to some extent their bodies for these trials because it's what they could do rather than wait it out. Hope needs action. It doesn't always just drift into our lives like a mist in the morning. We need to take hold of it. We need to, to reach out and to grasp it. But how do we do that? Well, last week, Keith shared some really important uh, lessons about where to look for hope and how to find it in Scripture. So I'm not going to repeat that. Go back to Keith's message. It's on our YouTube channel and you'll find it there. So we need to look for hope in Scripture. We need to look for hope in our world. There are organisations and, and groups out there that have nothing to do with the church and yet are places of hope. And when they match up with our Christian ideas and our Christian beliefs and our Christian faith and what God is calling us to do, if he's already doing it in some organisations out in the world, perhaps we need to join them. So we need to look for hope in scripture, we need to look for hope in our world, but looking is not enough. Now, I'm not a big shopper. <laughs> you probably know this. However, bike shops, that's a different story. But I, I don't know if you've been shopping recently and, you know, there's all these guidelines and advising and we've been telling our children when they've been in shops, don't touch anything. You know, don't touch. You can't touch anything because, you know, unless you're going to buy it, don't touch it because you might spread something. And there's all these signs that say, you know, please do not touch unless you're going to buy this. You can look, but just don't touch. Well, hope's the other way around. Hope is don't just look, touch, reach out, grasp. Don't just watch it. You must take hold of it. That's hope. We have this hope, says the writer to the Hebrews, a sure and a steadfast anchor for the soul, a hope that it enters the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered. There's a word in, in that um, reading that I read earlier, Melchizedek. It refers to this, uh, this almost um, strange character who turns up in the Old Testament, the idea that he was a priest long before the whole line of priests. And, and I don't want to get bogged down into who he was, but just to mention, he was a he, he was seen as a priestly figure, the, the perfect priest. So when it talks about Melchizedek in the Bible and Jesus being like him and Jesus being of his line, it's telling us that Jesus is like the perfect priest. If hope needs obedience and patience and action, hope also pursues. 
If we wired up the brain of a Christian filled with hope, any of you good folks out there, um, the region of the brain that deals with following, that deals with pursuit, should be and would be firing away. Electrons, just, um, some, oh, I don't even know what they're called. The, the little bits that fire in your brain, if you're lucky, will be firing away in the area of your brain that deals with pursuit and following. Hope pursues Jesus. Hope follows where he has led. Hope gives us access to the hidden places of God. Follows in the footsteps of the greatest pioneer. If hope is like an anchor that steadies the ship, and that holds us firm, even though a storm rages all about us. Hope can only do that because of where hope has been, because of who hope has followed. The writer to the Hebrews is well versed in the temple and the duties of priests and in what was required by the laws. But the writer doesn't just tell us about all these things on their own. They place Jesus in the picture. Jesus in the temple, Jesus in the tabernacle, Jesus in the law. And here is a picture of Jesus going into what we may think is the most holy place, the part of the temple or the tabernacle, which was so holy, so full of God's presence, that it could only be entered by the high priest once a year on the holiest day. But in the Hebrew world, there was also another curtain that's referred to, not just the curtain that separates the holy from the most holy. But one that was thought to separate heaven from earth. So when Jesus entered through, sorry, which Jesus entered through, this curtain was not just Jesus entering the temple, but Jesus entering the heavens, not when he died, but when he ascended into heaven forever. You see, the writer of this letter to the Hebrews did not leave their hope at the cross. There are some fantastic songs that speak of being at the cross and being near the cross. And, and we need that. But the writer to the Hebrews said that hope followed Jesus in his resurrection and in his ascension. Their hope pursued the pioneer of our faith. It didn't just stay at the cross. Listen to what they write in chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus didn't stay <coughs> on the cross and neither should our hope. Hope doesn't stay forever at forgiveness, but hope follows Jesus into heaven. Our hope pursues a risen saviour. And notice the language the writer uses to describe Jesus. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And earlier, he encourages us, seize the hope set before us. Follow Jesus' example. Even through the suffering that may come, by obedience, with patience, with purpose and with pursuit, we hope. Let's pray.
Father God, what a message of hope we find in your word. You know, every week as different people have dived into hope, we found something new, something different, something deep. And we just thank you for your word. We thank you that we can trust that you will bring things new and old to us. So Father, we pray in this time where many will be looking for hope. Father, may we be a people of hope. Lord, help us in our obedience, help us in our patience, help us as we seek to take hold of it and help us as we pursue Jesus and follow where he has led. Father, thank you that our faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things we have not yet seen. Lord, you are God. And this great mystery of your salvation is where our hope lies. In Jesus' name, Father, fill us with your hope through your Holy Spirit for his glory. Amen.